Bronwyn. And I'm very excited to be back here and be back teaching. So my name again is Carrie Wickstead and I'm doing this as a volunteer, but for my day job now, I'm working with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which is a nonprofit. And we work as the voice of fish and wildlife agencies across the states and in tribal territories and in Canada. So really excited to uh, see some familiar faces and some new ones. And I hope you're ready to rock and roll and learn about rodentia, which are one of my favorite groups of mammals, um, primarily because I rescue guinea pigs in my free time. So this is my, um, my president of our homeowners association right here, Ripple, one of our four permanent residents. And we have a foster that temporarily stays with us as well. So rodents are a really large group of mammals. They're actually the largest group of mammals around the world, and they represent almost 40% of the diversity of, of the world's mammals. So this is just a small sampling of some of the different rodents that you can see around, particularly here in North America. Anybody want to guess what continent has the highest density or diversity of rodents? Why don't you write that in the chat? What continent has the highest diversity of rodents? So continents like North America, South America, Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, not really much in Antarctica, so. <laughs> and while you're voting on the, um, the continent with the highest rodent diversity, this capybara right here is the largest rodent in the world. So um, they're large, they're the largest, and they're one of the longer lived rodent species too. So uh, they can sometimes live up to 20 years in certain conditions. And I'm seeing lots of votes for South America. So you are correct based on how the continents split apart and all of that. Um, there was a lot of speciation that happened in South America with the rodents. But uh, if you think about reptiles and amphibians, which is what I do with my day job now, Madagascar is actually one of the highest areas of biodiversity for reptiles and amphibians. So um, to be a rodent, they're in the order rodentia, and rodentia literally means to gnaw. So, um, and they're split up by basically how their jaw muscles attach to, uh, to their skulls there. So in the order rodentia, their teeth are highly specialized for gnawing and chewing on things. And you can see the classic designs of the rodent skulls, those large front incisors that never stop growing. There's a gap right there. The gap is known as a diastema. And then you have these cheek teeth in the back and the cheek teeth and the incisors are designed to wear down. So the dentin wears away and it leaves these ridges that makes it easy to crunch and grind plant materials. So um, rodents are currently grouped into different suborders based on how those jaw muscles, those jaw muscles that are attaching the lower jaw to the upper part of the skull, they're um, put into three separate separate groups based on those jaw muscle attachments. And the jaw muscles are known as the masseter muscles. So um, this is really why there is such a high diversity of rodents around the world, just because of the bite efficiency that's allowed by those jaw muscles and the attachment and all of that. So in the interest of time, we're going to skip over this one, but these are three different animals. This is a pika. I took a picture of this out in Oregon. There's our um, eastern cottontail and then a mole. And none of these actually are considered to be rodents. So the pika and the uh, rabbit are in a different order called Lagomorpha. And they actually, they have the similar incisors, but they actually have a second set of incisors behind those front ones. And they have some differences in terms of the muscle attachment and, and other things for those lagomorphs. So that's a story for another day. <laughs> and then our moles, a lot of people think moles are rodents just because they're small and fluffy and spend a lot of time in the ground, but they're actually really well adept carnivores and their teeth are all pointed and designed for eating meat. So moles eat meat. And later on in this presentation, I'll talk about voles, which eat vegetation. So one of our cooler rodents that we have here in Maryland that's in its own family and different from all the other rodents that we have in North America is the North American porcupine. And so they're also affectionately known as tree beavers just because of the way that uh, they climb and feed off of trees. 
So they're primary veg primarily vegetarians eating lots of leaves and berries and nuts. And those quills are really, really unique. So mammals are covered with different types of hair. They have these really long hairs called the guard hairs. And then they have those softer, denser furs called the under fur underneath. And the quills on the American porcupine are actually those guard hairs that are modified to be really keratinized. Keratin's what makes up our hair and our nails. And so those quills are much stronger stronger, much like our nails. They're quite stinky. Um, they use their urine to, uh, to mark their territories and to show receptivity with the females and mating. So um, there's a talk I give about wild sex and how nature does it. And it all started because my husband ha asked how North American porcupines did it. So, and the answer is very carefully. <laughs> um, so sometimes porcupines can be a pest. And here in Maryland, our porcupines are mainly in the western part of the state, so out in the mountain region, but the population's been expanding. And when I first started working for the Department of Natural Resources over 12 years ago, the porcupines were actually part of our rare species list, but they've been recently taken um, down because their population has just done so well. And in some areas, they are actually becoming a nuisance because they feed off of that cambium of the trees. You can see these marks. If you can imagine what beavers do to the base of the trees, that's what porcupines do to the top of trees. And they can be particularly damaging in fruit orchards and also pine tree plantations and things like that. We've had uh, cases where they've done thousands of dollars worth of damage to different tree farms. They, um, they will actually den in trees a lot of times, and all of this coming out of the tree is not actually the tree. That is all porcupine poop. And this is something because I love to look for track scat and sign of wildlife. This is something I would love to see, <laughs> even though it sounds kind of gross, but this is all porcupine poop. So they spend a lot of time eating and pooping. They're vegetarians. So, you know, lots of it coming out. Um, I, my husband asked why I'd be interested in that because with the guinea pigs, I kind of see this every day, but <laughs> it's a different size and from a different animal, right? Last thing I'm going to talk about with our porcupines is just the makeup of their um, their quills. It's really a, a really adaptative um, an adaptation marvel. So this is a highly magnified picture of a porcupine quill, and so um, essentially it's barbed, just like you know our our hair. It's scaly and barbed, but again, this is a really strong material. Interestingly enough, the way that those barbs are shaped allows that quill to enter skin flawlessly. So it actually can pierce the skin much easier than something like a hypodermic needle in the same shape and size of the quill. But those barbs also, um, even though they help with the entering into the skin, when it tries to come out of the skin, that's what really snags those quills into the skin of whatever might be disturbing those porcupines. And this is why if you ever have a dog um, that has been hit by a porcupine, you don't want to remove those quills yourself because it can do a lot of damage. And that's because of the way that they're barbed. And researchers have actually been looking at the structure of porcupine quills to make better needles, um, to giving like vaccines and drawing blood, and also for some of those adhesive qualities with the way that the, um, the barbs are structured. So um, there's a um, the picture, this, uh, this is from the, the paper. They were doing all sorts of tests on chicken breasts and they have pictures of that, but they were looking at the sticky adhesiveness and, and everything. So, all right, the next rodent that I'm gonna talk about is also in its own group. So our um, North American beaver or sometimes known as the Canadian beaver. So uh, this is our largest rodent that we have here in the United States. And so at one time, beavers could um, get as big as a bear back in the Pleistocene era. But now our beavers, the maximum size can be 100 pounds, which is still quite hefty for a rodent. Now, typically, they don't get that big. 30, 40 is usually a normal um, beaver size around here. 
Now, these animals are highly adapted for that semi-aquatic life. So they have transparent eyelids, so they're basically built-in goggles when they go swimming. And another cool thing is that their epiglottis is actually above the palate. And that allows when they're swimming, they usually swim with their head above. But if you think they all have, often have those branches in their mouth. So the nose is basically filtering right into the trachea and bypassing the mouth. And they can close off their mouth while they're swimming. Um, so they can hold those twigs without having water go down into their throat. So really cool adaptation there. Of course, they make really, um, really neat. Um, uh, it's comes out of the glands and it's it's like a, I'm forgetting the name of it, but a secretion that essentially helps with the water repellency on their fur, very thick and luxurious fur. Their tails actually store fat. So it's a very important fat storage for them. And, and that myth, that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to preserve beaver tails, just because um, it's a fatty tissue organ there. And they don't really use that to pat down uh, mud on dams. It's more for communication. They'll slap it on the water to warn others um, when they're around or just to tell you to get away. And, uh, and they also use it as that fat storage device. The last thing that I'm gonna say about beavers on this slide is that a long time ago, um, it's not done anymore, but one time beaver glands, the castorium glands um, in their behind, so beaver butt glands, were once used as an artificial flavoring. Well, actually it was called a natural flavoring, but it essentially the castorium gland is thick and oily and it has hints of vanilla and raspberry. And at one time it was used for those natural flavorings in um, absence of, of vanilla, which is made from orchids. So a um, long time ago, beaver castorium was much cheaper to use as that flavoring, but not anymore. Some people still use it, um, in, especially for distilling in liquors. And there was actually a distillery in Philadelphia that was making eau de musk or something like that, that was uh, a liquor made from some of the castorium from beavers. So beavers were almost wiped out um, in, at the turn of the century, much like many of our other animal species, but they were a high demand item because for over 200 years, it was a fashion statement and a social status to have a fine beaver felt hat. And so the style of the hat obviously changed over those 200 years, but the raw material, the beaver fur did not. And interestingly enough, if you look at some of the colonial expansion of the Western United States, some of that was fueled by finding new sources for beaver fur, furs, particularly Lewis and Clark's expedition and things like that. They were primarily looking for new sources of beaver to sell to the European market. And so this caused the collapse of many of the beaver populations, particularly in Eastern North America. And if you can believe, they were almost once extirpated from Maryland, uh, you know, a little over 100 years ago. So um, beavers have made a tremendous comeback. Um, there isn't much demand for the fur like there used to be. And also we now have regulations on trapping and removal of beavers. And now we're starting to see some nuisance beaver issues much more, much like we're seeing the nuisance porcupine issues. And we have to kind of find that balance between the human wildlife interface. Certainly they do some damage to trees and in the um, late summer, early fall, sometimes you will start to see large trees with chews, particularly up like a little further on the land and um, maybe some big trees and it might look like the beaver just gave up on it. Sometimes that's a, um, a, a sign that you have teenage beavers that are leaving home. Uh, they haven't figured out what trees are the best trees to chew yet, right? So they're testing out those teeth and, and all of that. Beavers um, make these really amazing lodges and dams. And, and some of the beaver dams, um, there's one in Canada that's really famous. You can actually see it from Google Earth. It's that large. So their dams are really well constructed. They're nature's engineers. They um, create these dams and, and they create these lodges out in the water to essentially create their own habitat. And they create habitat for a lot of different species. So beaver dams, um, those areas pulled by beavers have been found to have um, better water quality because it acts as a, a nitrogen sink. 
So it um, catches nitrogen and the nitrogen is able to convert in um, that slow moving water so it can collect, collect nitrogen and other pollutants. Um, those wetlands that are created by beavers can support tons of different species. And there's been studies looking at reptiles, amphibians, and songbirds that have all increased in areas that have been altered by the beavers. Their lodges are just as impressive as everything else that they build. Typically, the females that are raising the young are going to build those lodges out in the water. And, um, and so they have an underwater entrance. And that essentially is to provide protection from predators. So it makes it a little harder to get into. Just, not just beavers use these lodges. Um, it's not uncommon to have muskrats stop by or um, vol water voles and things like that. They'll sometimes hang out in beaver lodges and just take advantage of that ha um, habitat that was created. So they'll raise their young in there. And then outside of these lodges this time of year, it's good to start looking in the water because you'll see a bunch of these branches. A lot of them, you'll see those teeth marks where the, the um, bark has been chewed away and all of that. So they stash, um, can, they can stash up to 2000 pounds of branches in the water just to help them get through the winter and all of that. So they put it, they put them in the water because it essentially, um, it, it, you know, decomposes much slower. It's like their own built-in refrigerator, having it in the cold water. So it allows those sticks and all of that to stay fresh so they can get to that sugary sap right underneath the bark and, and feed off of it. Another sign for beavers in the area, particularly if you have male beavers, you will see these beaver mounds. And if you go along the Patuxent um, at Junk Bay and uh, Patuxent River Park, I see a lot of these. This was over at, um, at the Glendenning side of Jug Bay. But if you notice, um, this isn't the best picture because this one was, was knocked down, but um, you'll see a lot of mud and vegetation. And sometimes it looks like a big mound with a bunch of mud on it. And if you look in the background, you can see some of those stripped branches that were fed off of by the beavers. So this is something that the males build. It's a territorial thing. They um, build these big mounds right by their territories and then they rub their butts all over it. So taking those castorium scents and rub it all over to scent mark. And so um, sometimes they get destroyed by rival beavers that they will smell the, um, the other beaver scent there and they'll knock it down. So this one had been clearly knocked down by something. I don't know what, um, I didn't see any signs like by you know big old beaver tracks or anything obvious, but it was clear that this area was used by beavers. If you would like to do game um, cameras, like those motion sensor cameras, because sense stations are so important and, and um, for the beavers to communicate with one another, it's also a way they can communicate with their other mammal neighbors. So these are areas where you have lots of other mammals stopping by. It's like, you know, essentially their business card um, <laughs> on the ground. So, uh, so this is a good spot to put up a game camera just to see all the other animals that will come and visit in and check out those mounds as well. Beaver tracks are huge. Um, they're really hard to miss. And it, it just looks like dinosaur tracks sometimes in the mud. Um, they've got really stretched out fingers. Um, and of course, there's webbing on the back. And it's, um, it's very, very distinct. It doesn't look like anything else you'll find around here. So next, I'm going to move into the squirrel family, or Sayuridae. And this includes our tree squirrels, ground squirrels, and flying squirrels. Here in Eastern North America, we don't have quite the squirrel diversity as they do in the Western parts of the states. Out West, there's a tremendous number of ground squirrel species that are really adapted to living in those drier, deserty environments. And they spend a lot of their time sleeping, which I'm okay with, right? <laughs> so the only technical, technical, technical ground squirrel that we have here in Maryland is the groundhog, which is a type of marmot. And um, surprisingly, our groundhogs can climb trees. So not very well, but uh, this is actually a picture of a groundhog up in a tree. So, um, so you, you will see them up, up in trees. Sometimes they climb up in fruit trees to grab apples and pears and things like that. Sometimes they just go up there to escape predators or whatnot. Um, this is my groundhog in our backyard, the, our former groundhog that 
was the reason why I could never have a vegetable garden. Um, <laughs> and uh, they're also affectionately known as whistle pigs because they will whistle when um, there's danger around. But other than that, they don't make too many other noises. So groundhogs build really elaborate underground chambers and they're really good at building these things. Um, they actually have multiple chambers. So they'll have sleeping chambers and nursery chambers. They even have a waste chamber. They typically have several different holes that um, allow them to access and exit. So oftentimes in fields and areas that don't have a lot of cover, those holes are going to be these plunge holes. So if you've ever seen a, a, a groundhog out in the field and then all of a sudden it disappears, it likely was dropping down in one of those plunge holes. Whereas the main entrances are usually in more forested, like right at the edge of the woods, kind of covered a little bit more, and they're a little bit easier to, uh, to enter and exit from. They don't have that advantage of being able to quickly disappear in those areas. So in the springtime, they're really easy to see, particularly along roadways, because you will see those dirt porches as the groundhogs dig their ways out of their burrows. Um, typically in early spring, they don't come out um, to see if their, their shadow is there or not. The males actually come out of hibernation early to shack up with the females for a couple weeks before he mates with her and then leaves her to raise the young. So in February, sometimes you will see some groundhog activity, but it's um, mainly to, to find, find a lady in, in that regard. So a lot of things use these groundhog burrows. Um, and so, you know, foxes often use groundhog burrows and um, other animals. And so down, um, down the hill from my house, I actually have had a fox den. And what's really interesting is it started as a groundhog, then it went to the foxes. It was the gray foxes, then the red foxes. And this year I had raccoons using it. So they were using the, uh, the, the former groundhog den. And it was really funny because the fox would stop by every day and often would poop right in front of the groundhog den just to say like, that used to be mine. I have a game camera that I put up on it. So one of the ways to tell the difference whether or not the groundhogs um, are occupying these areas versus the foxes, Groundhogs are a lot cleaner than foxes, so they aren't going to have a lot of mess outside. You're not going to have strong smells like fox smells and things like that. Um, and, and sometimes you'll just see a bunch of flies buzzing around the entrance because there often are um, like, you know, fruit scraps and plant scraps in those in those um, burrows that attract the flies. Foxes, in contrast, are extremely messy. It's going to be stinky. You'll smell that, that fox urine and things like that in there. Um, and, uh, and you'll see fox poop outside of the den and often lots of dead stuff, um, particularly when the young start to venture out. Uh, parents often will bring back scraps of other animals, deer legs, you know, bird wings, things like that. The young will feed off of them. They often, um, foxes often steal stuff too. So one year my foxes were stealing a bunch of garden gloves from my neighbors. <laughs> so there were a bunch of garden gloves right outside the tent entrance. And, uh, and it's not uncommon for foxes to steal shoes too. So. so those are things to look for in the differences between those two types of dens. And I see a question about whether or not groundhogs utilize the same burrows year after year. Sometimes they do, um, and then sometimes they, they use different areas. And the turnaround chamber is essentially allows those, um, because these are really tight passages and uh, groundhogs are kind of hefty. <laughs> the turnaround chamber is just a little wider section in the burrow that allows them to move around a little bit more. It's really surprising like how some of those animals can squeeze into what seem like such tiny entrance holes, particularly the foxes. Use, seeing them go into those dens, it's just like they must be all fur. <laughs> so. All right, so our tree squirrels are those that typically spend their time up in trees. So we have the Eastern gray squirrels, the Eastern fox squirrels. We also have red squirrels in parts of the state. The gray squirrels and the fox squirrels tend to have a lot of different melanisms. So these are just different colors of their coats. And um, particularly our gray squirrels here in Maryland, you see a lot that are black, 
Um, they're ones that are leukistic. This one is, isn't albino because it still has pigmentation in the eye and you can see some rusty pigmentation in the tail, but there have been albino squirrels here in Maryland too. Um, somebody with my former job sent me a picture of an albino squirrel and then she sent me a photo book of her albino squirrel, which she affectionately named Albi. And uh, I got to see pictures of Albi and his friends in the neighborhood. Some of the black morph gray squirrels in, um, in the western part of Maryland or like, like around the DC region, we can actually blame Canada for because at one time Canada gave the um, Smithsonian a bunch of black squirrels. They were free ranging squirrels there at the, the zoo. And of course they didn't stay within the confines of the zoo. And so they, they spread out into other parts of DC, Montgomery County, but I've seen them all over the state, um, in like Calvert and Charles County and places like that. So I don't know if they're from that original Canada source population or it's just those color changes that naturally occur in, um, in the populations. Interestingly enough, um, as you go down south, the fox squirrels tend to get darker and bigger too. So fox squirrels are much heftier than our gray squirrels. Um, they've got a lot more body to them. And uh, I remember seeing a fox squirrel down in North Carolina this past spring, and I addressed it as sir, <laughs> just because it was just so big and just staring at me. And, and it was one of these darker morphs there. So our Delmarva fox squirrel is a formerly rare squirrel that is primarily found on the Delmarva Peninsula. So just between Maryland and Delaware and Virginia. And the largest portion of the population is actually in Dorchester County, Maryland. So they look like a cross between our Eastern gray squirrels and the fox squirrels. So they've got that grayish, co grayish coloration of the gray squirrel, but the body of a fox squirrel and uh, the attitude of fox squirrels too, because fox squirrels tend to be a little, little more, I wouldn't like to say docile, but they just don't care quite as much as the gray squirrels. So they've got a lot of white on them. And, and in the mid 20th century, there was a huge decline of these Delmaro fox squirrels, primarily because about 90% of their habitat on the Eastern shore was lost due to timbering and other and agriculture and things like that. So this is one of the species that we can actually hail as a conservation success. However, there was a very big push with the unit, US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Natural Resources in Maryland and in Delaware to do a bunch of programs to restore the habitat, protect the habitat, and even do some rearing and releasing and all of that. And they were actually delisted in 2015 because there were over 20,000 that were documented. So it, it's been a great success story for the Delmarva fox squirrel, but um, the right now, even though we've got a lot of protections for their habitat and the population has increased so much, um, sea level rise and climate change are now the large threats to this species because with current climate change models um, and sea level rise, a lot of Dorchester County is going to be underwater. So, um, so that's a problem there. One of our most common squirrels, but least encountered is actually the Southern flying squirrel. And I remember the first time I learned that we had these gorgeous creatures in Maryland and my mind was blown. And um, this was actually a picture taken by one of my classmates, Leonard Cage, uh, when I did some small mammal live trapping. And, and this is one of the first ones I got to see live. So it was really fascinating. So these are very common squirrels, but they're out at night. And that's why they've got those giant eyes for seeing at night. And they spend all their time up in the trees. So they're arboreal, but they're extremely noisy. And this is the time of year to listen for the Southern flying squirrels. And I actually heard them two nights ago when I was having trouble sleeping, they were up there squealing in the trees. So I'm gonna play this noise really quick. And this is a time of year to go outside and listen for this noise, particularly around oaks and hickories and other nut bearing trees because they're caching all that food. So I'm gonna play this.
It almost sounds like a bird, um, but a little bit raspier than a bird. And you'll hear it up in the tops of the trees. And um, sometimes I hear them sitting up there arguing too, because they have a lot of fights between one another about who's going to have the best acorn and all of that. So um, yeah, and Darla, they can be a problem. They can do a lot of damage, um, getting into houses and chewing through wires and things like that. So good to exclude them from there. Just recently, researchers also found out they glow in the dark. So um, certain animals and organisms like lichens, when you shine UV on them, they glow. And this is a, um, a flying squirrel under UV light, and you can see that bright pink glow on their body. So researchers haven't figured out why they glow yet, um, probably to do with, you know, seeing at night because a lot of different animals, not us, um, but a lot of different animals see in the UV spectrum. And so this might help with that nocturnal vision and all of that. And yes, they will use bluebird boxes. So it's a, it's a cavity. So they're cavity nesters. And oftentimes they'll use those bluebird boxes that have been placed like at the forest edges that are a little more shaded and covered. So uh, if you want, you know, if you've got them around and you want to put up a house for them, just get a bluebird house and put it in the woods. And, um, and that's often a spot that they'll use. So I'm going to quickly just play this uh, part of this video from National Geographic, just so you can see some of the adaptations of the wings or not really wings, Risk but to the flaps animals. of skin that they have. Their wings are flaps of skin stretched between their wrists and their ankles. Their hands and feet wiggle in opposite directions to help control their descent. A tail with feathered fur helps them change direction mid-flight. He uses it as like a rudder. Cartilage alongside their wrists can slow them down for landing. This cartilage flares and acts like a stole tip on the wing of an airplane on a short runway. Kickoff. Really amazing, isn't it? And I will suggest um, from personal experience, well, I, I didn't, but um, they have very sharp teeth. So that researcher handling that flying squirrel with his bare hands, not recommended. Um, when we did small mammal live trapping in the classes that I took back in the day, um, one of my classmates handled that flying squirrel and got some nasty bites. And also being that it is a wild mammal, even though rabies rates in things like squirrels are low, it's not impossible. So we had to go and get rabies shots as well. So don't handle any wild mammals, even cute little flying squirrels with your bare hands. Just keep that in mind. They got sharp teeth and they surprisingly do have quite a bit of attitude, even though they look like they're sweet. <laughs> Just like my guinea pig ripple. So now we're going to move on to our larger groups of rodents. And these are the, the mice. So mice all used to be in the family Muridae. And Depending on where, they, where you fall um, with the recent research, some of them split Muridae into a couple families with the New World mice and rats, um, the Chrysiidae, uh, versus the, um, the Muridae, which are all now the old rats. So um, one of the Murids that are former Murids, now um, the New World in the New World group, is the woodland jumping mouse. And this is a mammal species I would love to see. So they have primarily been just documented out in Garrett County in Maryland. They look a lot like um, a regular mouse, but if you look closely, you'll see this dark stripe here on the back. It has this dark, um, dark brownish coloration compared to the chestnut on its sides. If you were able to see the full um, feet, the feet are much larger and um, big. They're almost like little kangaroo feet for this jumping mouse, and they have an extremely long tail. Um, this jumping mouse, uh, actually, its diet is mostly made up of fungi, but it also eats insects and um, other like vegetation and stuff. And they're called jumping mice because they can jump up to two feet in the air and up to six feet in length, um, even though they're these tiny, tiny little creatures that you can find them. And um, the stripes really aren't lateral lines. It's more like a big dark, it looks like somebody just took a paintbrush down the back end or, you know, a stain, like a dark stain down the back <laughs> on the woodland jumping mouse. 
So it's a little more obvious in some of the other pictures, but this is one of the few ones that I could use um, with permissions there. So up next are our voles. We have several species of voles here in Maryland and voles are vegetarian. They eat vegetation. A lot of people confuse voles and moles and moles eat meat, so M for meat. So our two most common moles that you can find here in Maryland are voles. <laughs> See, I'm already doing it. Two most common voles you can find here in Maryland are the meadow vole and the woodland vole. And the difference between the two is really the length of the tail. The meadow vole has a tail that comes in at almost two inches in length, whereas the woodland vole's tail is less than an inch in length. To me, voles kind of look like a wild hamster. So if you see something that kind of looks hamster-like running around in your yard, um, it potentially could be a vole. They're really common. These um, meadow voles are very, very common in backyards. I've got I've got a ton of voles <laughs> that are around. So they are um, typically dark brownish in color and they have these bicolor tails. So the top is darker than the bottom, at least for the meadow voles. And they can do a lot of damage. They can eat a lot of vegetation. So if you ever have little holes um, popping up in your vegetable garden and missing vegetables and or vegetables that have tiny little teeth marks in it, there's a good chance that it's voles in your garden. They also eat a lot of roots of plants, so um, not all gardeners really appreciate the voles. But someone who does appreciate the voles are our barn owls. An adult barn owl can eat up to four meadow voles a day, and it's actually one of the majority parts of their, a major parts of their diet is actually made up of meadow voles in the wild. So this is where the problem comes in because people sometimes poison those voles to get rid of them in their backyards and then our owls eat them and they get poisoned secondarily. So that's an issue. And certainly with the way that um, we've changed some of our practices with farming and things like that to discourage the vole populations, that has inadvertently caused the decline of those barn owls in some of those areas because of the loss of the food source. So food source and habitat, um, you know, that also comes into play with some of the declines of our barn owls. And this is an example of a vole nest. So this was stuffed into a log at Jug Bay. And um, the only reason I found this vole nest was it was uh, on top, it was because at the top of the log, there was a big old pile of coyote scat. So the coyote must have smelled that vole, um, marked the top of the log, and, uh, and then let everybody know that it wanted that vole inside. But I found the nest, so I don't know if the vole was still there, if the coyote got its meal, but, um, but this was a cool find when I was at Jug Bay. A really neat rodent that we have that's rare here in Maryland is the Allegheny wood rat. And um, this is a species that's federally listed and still continuing to decline here in Maryland and throughout its range in the Northeastern United States. So habitat loss is a big factor with the decline of the Allegheny wood rat. They live in these rocky areas and certainly the, the loss of American chestnuts, which was a, a major food source for this species caused some of the decline. And there has been some research by Dr. Sunshine Brosi, formerly at Frostburg State University, showing that they have switched their diets to, um, to acorns from white oaks and things like that. But it wasn't the same substitute as the chestnuts, just because the chestnuts were much more prolific and all of that. Another reason for decline is actually raccoon roundworm. And so many raccoons have roundworm and it's fatal to many of our other mammal species, including to some of our pets. And, um, and so this is a parasite that's carried in their feces. And in some areas, the expansion of the raccoon population because of development and things like that have caused these raccoons and wood rats to come in contact with one another. And that's where the disease gets passed on. So there have been some research looking at that raccoon roundworm as well. So the wood rats are actually a type of rat known as a pack rat because they're known for gathering a bunch of food and they pee on it to preserve it. And in places like the Southwest, pack rat middens, which is the, where they stash all their food, researchers have actually found thousand year old middens and have reconstructed vegetation dynamics in areas based on the 
the, the plants and, and things like that that have been found in those pack rat mittens. So the other thing about them, they're really chill. Um, so Dan Feller, the, um, the biologist who studies them here in Maryland, says that they're just so, you know, easy to work with compared to some of the other wild mammals that he works with. And they have a fully furred tail. So it's not scaly and naked like other rat species. And one of their defense mechanisms is called degloving, where they actually lose all the hair off their tail as one big, you know, part, <laughs> like a glove, unfortunately. The white-footed deer mouse is um, very common across the state. So you've probably seen one or had one maybe visit in your house in the fall. They typically don't um, come in year round. It's mainly this time of year that they start to seek shelter. They are bicolor, so they're dark on the top and light on the bottom. And so that's the difference between these guys and the um, that European house mouse, which is the, the invasive species that does stay year round in your house, they're brown. The house mouse is brown on the top and on the bottom. You can see those typical white feet there. They've got a bicolor tail, and they are also the um, primary carrier of Lyme disease in the area. So usually those ticks um, feed off of white-footed deer mice that have that Lyme disease, and, and so they're really responsible for a lot of the spread in the area. Uh, you can often see these little footprints around um, in mud and in sand and in snow. Um, excuse me, and in the snow, you, uh, you'll, you'll see those tail drags too. So that's pretty characteristic of them. And they can climb trees as well. The marsh rice rat is a species that you'll find in the coastal plain of Maryland. And so like right along the Patuxent with all those wild rice marshes, lots of marsh, marsh rice rats and a very important food resource for those barn owls as well. So they've got a super long tail, a skinny body, and unlike the non-native rats, which I'll show you on the next slide, they are also bicolor. So they're darker on top and lighter underneath. Um, they can dive up to 30 feet underwater and can swim nearly a thousand feet. So they're really good at swimming. You'll find them in tidal marshes and swamps. And even though they're called rice rats, uh, a lot of their diet is made up of snails and clams and insects. And then the sort, certainly this time of year when the wild rice is ripe, they'll eat wild rice and plants and other vegetation. So really quickly, the two non-native rats that we have here in Maryland, the Norway rats are the more common of the two. They've got really big, thick heads and um, smaller ears and the roof rats have bigger ears um, and a little more slender face. But uh, both of these are, you know, the same color top and bottom, um, whereas those marsh rice rats are um, darker on the top and they've got that white underneath. So keep in mind, the Norway rats do have white feet, but the underbelly is still brown on those Norway rats and they can get rather large here in Maryland. The last um, rodent I'm going to talk about for native rodent is the nutria. So very, very cute semi-aquatic rodent that we have here. And, um, and so they have a rounded face um, and this little tail that's flattened on the side so they can use it as a paddle when they swim along. They have luxurious fur. It is super, super soft. So they can stay submerged for up to 20 minutes at a time. And these are just some examples of what it looks like when you have muskrats. Um, they will den in banks and sometimes they can destabilize banks, which can be a problem in some areas with the muskrats. But this is a classic example of a muskrat bank den. But they also will make um, what look like beaver lodges out in the marsh, but they cut up cattails. And so if it looks like a beaver lodge, but if, if it's made of you know, non-witty vegetation in the marsh, it likely was from a muskrat. So typically they don't swim like this. This was just the only photo that I've got of one swimming in the water. You often will see a couple humps in the water when they swim. And then finally, there are the invasive nutria. So these were brought up from South America as a get rich quick scheme. And so they've got a big squared off face and white whiskers. So sometimes people confuse them with beavers. Beavers do not have white whiskers and they don't have that square beefy face. 
So they came from South America because it was believed that uh, they would be an excellent substitute for beaver. And they often are misidentified as beavers. Even today, a lot of stock photos of beavers are actually nutria. <laughs> and, uh, and so in the 1940s, um, the market really crashed for fur. And a lot of people released the nutria that they bought to get rich. And that included in Maryland. And so um, we had a big problem with nutria. Um, from the 1943 to about 2002, nutria weren't really managed in Maryland, but from 2002 to 2016, there was a huge removal effort with the Chesapeake Bay Nutria Project, and they have not been seen in Maryland since 2016, thanks to that project, but you can just see some of the damage that they do by eating the roots of the wetland vegetation. So yeah, knock on wood, um, I believe the estimates are if they haven't seen any nutria by 2022, we officially can say they're extirpated from Maryland, but they're certainly still in Virginia, so that's a concern. So when we think about our rodents, a lot of people don't think about helping rodents, but just like other mammals, um, they can use habitat and not handouts. So don't feed them, you know, provide habitat and resources for them, natural places for them to use and not our houses and stuff like that. Cats are a really big problem with rodents. Um, not only do they kill them, but they pass on diseases like toxoplasmosis, which can affect reproduction and survival and everything. Respect their space. Don't take selfies with squirrels. Squirrels still will attack and they have sharp teeth, you know? So keep that in mind and educate others. And my last thing is a plug for my current job. So Recovering America's Wildlife Act is right now um, on the Senate floor and it's in the House. And it is a $1.4 billion bill earmarked specifically for species of greatest conservation need, species that have been determined by different states to be in need of conservation, our box turtles, our wood rats, and things like that. We have a desperate need for funding for non-game or non-hunted species. So um, it's in the House and the Senate right now, Senator Cardin here in Maryland has not gotten behind it yet. So uh, he's a great person to contact and, um, and get in touch with because this would be literally a game changer for wildlife. And you can uh, um, contact me more for more information and all of that. I'm gonna post the Alliance there, but the more people that support it, the better chances we'll have. So with that, we're right at eight o'clock. And if we have time for questions, I will take some questions while you admire some of my beautiful little piggies. Hey, Carrie, that was wonderful. Yeah, let's, can we come back and um, unshare and do questions? Sure. As a group? I mean, I don't not want to see your beautiful babies, but. <laughs> That's all right. Um, thank you so much. Let me just put a, spotlight on you. Uh, Eddie wants to know why Cardin is a holdout. I wouldn't really I necessarily know. call him a holdout. He just hasn't um, sponsored. You know, well, he hasn't, um, I'm trying to think of the terminology. There are four co-sponsors on the bill and there are several senators who have started to support it, but it was just introduced at the end of July. It hasn't been out very long. They've been in a recess for the last couple of weeks. So now is the time to strategize and, and get the senators on board, so. Okay. Um, do we have some more questions for Carrie? Anything that you wanted to know about rodents, we're, we're afraid to ask. This is your time to, to ask. Don't be shy. If you want to raise your hand and unmute and ask a question that way, that's fine. I can recognize you and do that. Or you can put the question into um, the chat box. My, 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 my new vocabulary word for today is gloving. So that is, that's very, <laughs> I might have a nightmare about that tonight. But yeah. let's see, Robert, so how do you tell voles from field mice? Ah, yes. So voles look more like hamsters. So they've got more rounded bodies like a hamster, right? Um, their head, they're not going to have that distinct neck. <laughs> um, they're, they're much more 
I wouldn't say a potato, but maybe kiwi shaped um, in, in terms of their bodies and their tails are much shorter too. So our woodland voles, the tails are only about two inches, but field mice are going to have, you know, tails that are probably three to four inches. Um, do you have any advice for getting groundhogs to go from our yards into natural areas? Or if you are I mean, what if you're having one or you maybe have a have a heart or something, what is the best options for that if you do have a garden and, and like to grow vegetables? Yeah. So in Maryland, it is legal to trap and relocate groundhogs. For most mammals, it's not legal or you need a special permit to do that. Uh, I will say with groundhogs, even though it's legal, it's not always the most humane method to deal with that essentially, because if you trap them and relocate them, you're putting them in an unknown habitat where they don't know where their food is and all of that. And groundhogs certainly can have some moxie, but studies with a lot of relocated wildlife showed that they just don't survive um, in those relocated areas. So if you have one in your backyard that you're dealing with, the first thing is to figure out what's attracting them to your yard. And it's for most mammals, it ends up being a food source. Um, so whatever food is attracting them and excluding them from that food source. So if you've got a veggie garden, put your fence around it, but you got to put that fence down because they can dig under that fence. <laughs> and I was just not there yet. I didn't grow a lot of veggies. So I enjoyed the groundhog and I was like, yeah, I don't, I can go buy my veggies. So, um, so that's one thing if you're dealing with the food or a lot of times people have trouble because they will burrow under garages and sheds and things like that. And that's where the exclusion is also important, essentially putting fencing around, digging that fencing down slightly into the grounds and excluding them from being able to easily use that habitat. So those are the main methods to um, deal with groundhogs. And uh, sometimes they get the hint to go to other areas. So, um, and sometimes, you just have to wait them out, which is what I did for a couple of years. <laughs> and I just appreciated my groundhog when he waddled into the yard. So should you go eight, how deep should you go if you're trying to exclude a groundhog? Um, I, I don't remember exactly how deep it is. Let me, um, I'll pull up the wildlife help website and that should have um, information on it. So it's a really nice website. You can select for species and habitats and, um, or I mean, areas like, like different states and stuff. So it's usable more than just in Maryland. And if it comes down to it and you need professional help, they also have the list of professional licensed people to help with that. Darla would really love if you could show that jaw structure slide again. Sure thing. So this is just the, um, the same skull right here. And looking at the skull, I believe this might be a beaver just because you can see those tubular like ears. Um, they can also close their ears so they don't get water in their ears when they <laughs> dive under the water. Ama another amazing adaptation that they have. So um, this is just showing you the different types of the masseters. Um, and, uh, and so those different, different ways that the uh, muscles attach. So chipmunks are found here in Maryland. So they are considered to be um, a squirrel species. I guess they're technically a ground squirrel. So, um, so yes, chipmunks are here in Maryland. You don't see them much where I'm at on the coastal plain, but in the Piedmont and the Western part of the state, there are a lot of chipmunks. So you hear them chirping and all of that. Another species, which looks super cute, but man, when we did live trapping of um, small mammals, chipmunks were my least favorite animal to capture in those live traps because they are ferocious little things. And river otter, Charlene, are actually a form of weasel or mustelid. So they're in the mustelidae family. So um, they, uh, they have, mustelids have very specialized teeth in terms of like well-developed carnassials, the top premolars and the bottom molars. I might have it backwards, but 
the way that they come together, it's like a, a almost a, you know, they're built in scissors, meat scissors in their mouth. And they also have well-developed anal scent glands for marking. So otters do a lot of marking as well. So, and that long tubular body, those are all characteristics of the Mastellidae. Carrie, how many, how many rodent species are there in Maryland? I know that you said that's the, the, the number one um, most in, in the world uh, in terms of uh, mammals, but how many are we found in Maryland? According to the Maryland Biodiversity Project, 26, but I believe that includes um, some extirpated species. I feel like, I think it's the Eastern Harvest Mouse, which might not be in Maryland anymore. I'd have to check that out. So is there a life list? Do you have a life list to see all of Maryland's 26 species of, of, uh, of rodents? And how are you doing on that? Uh, I don't have, you know, I always talk about having like a life list and I don't for, you know, just all the things that I see. And I started doing it in iNaturalist, but then I just didn't continue. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and Darla wants to know about the color of the teeth. Yeah, so are not they, all not all are orange or yellow. And um, that actually is a, a great question. Something I forgot to address when I was talking about the beavers. And um, beavers have those bright orange incisors and it's actually, it's reinforced with iron. So that's iron in their teeth to help it with the strength and all of that. But some rodents like guinea pigs don't have that, um, that enforcement in their teeth. So they don't have those yellow teeth there. Any other questions for Carrie? Um, I, so the, the rats, I had a question, sorry, Carrie. Uh, I know you don't mind some questions. Um, the rats that we have in Baltimore <laughs> um, are, you know, our mascot is, so those, that, that was the, um, they're not native? Nope. Yeah, they're mostly the Norway rats. I imagine there might be some black rats in, or the black rat slash roof rats in Baltimore as well, but it's mostly Norway rat species that you'll see in Baltimore. So Carrie, can you hear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that, that occasionally they, they still see nutria along the Patuxent uh, at Jug Bay and at Patuxent River Park. Have you not heard that? So there was a documentation on the, most of the, the nutria were on the Eastern shore. There mm -hmm. was a documentation on the Western shore along the Patuxent, but um, from what I gather, it's no more. And I think it was just like a one-time thing. Um, a lot of people, just from my experience, um, my former experience with the Department of Natural Resources, we would get a lot of pictures of groundhogs and musk muskrats that right. were misidentified as nutria. And um, if you look at stock photography, it's, I, I was just, I just saw a, a news article that a friend had shared on Facebook and it was about beavers, but of course, like the picture was a nutria because <laughs> they had bought it, you know, from like an eye stock site or something like that. So it's really, it's easy to mistake the three species and actually four of them, if you include the groundhogs, if you're not used to identification. Yeah, I was thinking that there were uh, what's, what looked like tail drags down there, but maybe you're right. It might be some years ago. Hey, Lloyd, we had a presentation a few months ago from Fish and Wildlife Service on the Nutria Eradication Program in Maryland, and it kind of gave the history, and it also talked about the detector dogs that were trained to sniff out Nutria, which was really yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and so I, I can, from that presentation that was just recent, can confirm what, what Carrie was saying about um, the non-sightings, which was wonderful. Um, and you can you can see that presentation also on our YouTube and learn more about about nutria and the eradicate the amazing eradication project that happened here. Oh yeah, they yeah. did an amazing job. I thought that that presentation, which I think I looked at, was uh, a sort of going back over the same ground in uh, around Blackwater and Dorchester County, trying to find out if if in fact there there were some nutria coming back because there was some evidence of marsh gnawing and so forth. 
but I guess they, uh, I guess Carrie is saying that they didn't come up with any more. So that's great. Yeah, they're but certainly we, prevalent in North Carolina. I can tell you that. Yeah, and the other thing is they're in Virginia too. So yeah, you know yeah. that's where things like Recovering America's Wildlife Act would be helpful because it could really address some larger scale issues. It includes um, invasive species management under that as well, um, in terms of invasive species that might impact species of greatest conservation need. So. Right. So. Um, Janina is interested to know if sweet potatoes are toxic to Norway rats. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I know that potatoes, I can't feed my guinea pigs. So um, they're, not, they're not something I can give to the guinea pigs. So it could be just how the potatoes are broken down by the rodent digestive systems. I didn't get into all that, but it's mostly bacterial driven digestion and really fascinating how it works. Um, and uh, and very sensitive in, in some cases as well. Maybe we'll have to have a presentation on the digestive system of rodents then. I didn't know it was so fascinating. <laughs> well, I, I just know too from my guinea pigs and dealing with like gastrointestinal issues, like how sensitive um, they can be. And I see a question from Eddie about rodents that make the best eating, so. Yeah. I, uh, I've personally eaten squirrel, so, um, and it, right now we're in squirrel season, so you can get your hunting license and hunt squirrel here in Maryland. My only complaint about squirrels is that there isn't a lot of meat for all the work you have to do, <laughs> but um, it, you know, it's just a, a meat kind of like chicken or any other thing. You throw it in a pot pie or casserole and, and it's your meat in there. And um, I know muskrats are often eaten, especially on the Eastern shore. And they have like some places on the Eastern shore that still serve muskrat. I have not tried it myself. And apparently nutria is the other, other white meat. My coworker would joke, you know, the play off the pork commercials and, and all of that. So he said that nutria was okay in some cert circumstances, so. Well, they know that it, I'm from Louisiana and they tried to um, get the chefs down there to come up with new recipes for Nutria to create a, a market to, yeah. to help with the eradication project down there. There's just too many and people didn't like the idea. They just And I think some of it is the diet too, you know, because the diet can really influence the flavor of the meat. And when you get these marsh animals, it gets really greasy and, you know, it it's not always something that a lot of people like in terms of meat. If you cook muskrat, cook it way outside. <laughs> Is Do it not stinky? Cook it inside. It has an odorous, terrible smell. Yeah. Yeah. My neighbor tried to get my wife to cook the muskrat and she threw him and the muskrat out. <laughs> Groundhog ought to be good eating, given the fact that they eat all the vegetables in your garden. Yeah, some people do eat groundhogs too. So, yeah. and also, by the way, uh, sweet potatoes are a magnet for groundhogs. Hmm. They really. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that... they'll, they'll even eat the foliage before the potato develops. Yeah, I had to laugh when I had my garden. Um, you know, it was my early days of teaching about backyard wildlife, and they always say peppers, hot peppers, discourage groundhogs. So. Yeah. We yeah. had the last thing standing. We only had like tomatoes and peppers and uh, I think one other thing, but it was just the, the jalapenos that were left. And we saw the groundhog coming out, waddling out of the forest. So we're, my husband and I are at the window, like eat the pepper, eat the pepper and like cheering him on just to eat the jalapeno, watch his reaction as he like gets upset eating the jalapeno and then run away. But he went and he ate the like half the jalapeno, spit out the seeds, and then just waddled back to the forest. And and we were just like standing there, like that was so anticlimactic, you know. <laughs> like there was no reaction. He didn't care. And then I got these really hot pepper seeds from one of our volunteers who grew like special hot peppers. And my plan was to put those out in the backyard, but I just gave up on dealing with the groundhogs. So. Maybe one day I'll plant some ghost peppers just to give them a little pizzazz. <laughs> Any other questions for Carrie this evening? 
or gardening tips for, uh, for rodent control. And I'll um, give a, a plug um, on Saturday morning with Anne Arundel County Public Library. I'll be giving a talk on beneficial bugs in your garden. So if you want to learn about some insects that you might have in your backyard that can help it out, um, come check it out. I want to know what, what rodent is on your earring. Oh, these are chipmunks. So thanks to um, Robinson Nature Center. All right. Well, thank you, Carrie, so much for this evening. Um, I know that it gives us, shines a new light on, on rodents. When you, you hear rodents and you think rats, but they are so much more than that. And they really are rocking and they're important in our ecosystem. And we, we, we now um, can appreciate them a little bit more because of uh, the knowledge that you imparted upon us. So thank you so much for that. Um, good luck in your new uh, position. And we hope that you will come back and teach some more for us. Uh, Anytime. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Have a great, great evening. Yes. Thanks, Thanks everybody lot, for coming out. See y'all soon. Stay curious, everybody. You bet.